Evil Confronted Jesus was led into the wilderness, according to the story, to be tempted by the devil, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, prior to his crucifixion. This is the story of Cain, restated abstractly. Cain is neither content nor happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks, but God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is, by all appearances, dancing his way through life. His crops flourish. Women love him. Worst of all, he's a genuinely good man. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to envy and hate him. Things do not progress well for Cain by contrast, and he broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. He strives, in his misery, to give birth to something hellish, and in doing so, enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune, his betrayal by God. He nourishes his resentment. He indulges in ever more elaborate fantasies of revenge, and as he does so, his arrogance grows to Luciferian proportions. I'm ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. This is a stupid bloody planet. As far as I'm concerned, it can go to hell. And with that, Cain encounters Satan in the wilderness for all intents and purposes and falls prey to his temptations. And he does what he can to make things as bad as possible, motivated by, in John Milton's imperishable words, So deep a malice to confound the race of mankind in one root and earth with hell. To mingle and involve, done all to spite the great creator. Cain turns to evil to obtain what good denied him, and he does it voluntarily, self-consciously and with malice aforethought. Christ takes a different path. His sojourn into the desert is the dark night of the soul, a deeply human and universal experience. It's the journey to that place each of us goes when things fall apart. Friends and family are distant. Hopelessness and despair reign, and black nihilism beckons. And let us suggest, in testament to the exactitude of the story, forty days and nights starving alone in the wilderness might take you exactly to that place. It is in such a manner that the objective and subjective worlds come crashing, synchronistically, together. Forty days is a deeply symbolic period of time, echoing the forty years the Israelites spent wandering in the desert after escaping the tyranny of Pharaoh and Egypt. Forty days is a long time in the underworld of dark assumptions, confusion, and fear. Long enough to journey to the very center, which is hell itself. A journey there to see the sights can be undertaken by anyone. Anyone, that is, who is willing to take the evil of self and man with sufficient seriousness. A bit of familiarity with history can help. A sojourn through the totalitarian horrors of the 20th century with its concentration camps, forced labor, and murderous ideological pathologies is as good a place as any to start. That and some consideration of the fact that the worst of the concentration camp guards were human, all too human too. That's all part of making the desert story real again, part of updating it for the modern mind. After Auschwitz said Theodore Adorno, student of authoritarianism, There should be no poetry. He was wrong. But the poetry should be about Auschwitz. In the grim wake of the last ten decades of the previous millennium, the terrible destructiveness of man has become a problem whose seriousness self-evidently dwarfs even the problem of unredeemed suffering. And neither one of those problems is going to be solved in the absence of a solution to the other. This is where the idea of Christ taking on the sin of mankind, as if they were his own, becomes key, opening the door to deep understanding of the desert encounter with the devil himself. Homo sum humani nihil a me alienum puto, said the Roman playwright Terence. Nothing human is alien to me. No tree can grow to heaven, adds the ever-terrifying Carl Gustav Jung, psychoanalyst extraordinaire unless its roots reach down to hell. Such a statement should give everyone who encounters it pause. There was no possibility for movement upward in that great psychiatrist's deeply considered opinion without a corresponding move down. It is for this reason that enlightenment is so rare. Who is willing to do that? Do you really want to meet who's in charge at the very bottom of the most wicked thoughts? 
What did Eric Harris, mass murderer of the Columbine High School, write so incomprehensibly the very day prior to massacring his classmates? It's interesting when I'm in my human form, knowing I'm going to die. Everything has a touch of triviality to it. Who would dare explain such a missive? Or worse, explain it away? In the desert, Christ encounters Satan. See Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 13 and Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. This story has a clear psychological meaning, a metaphorical meaning in addition to whatever else material and metaphysical alike it might signify. It means that Christ is forever he who determines to take personal responsibility for the full depth of human depravity. It means that Christ is eternally he who is willing to confront and deeply consider and risk the temptations posed by the most malevolent elements of human nature. It means that Christ is always he who is willing to confront evil consciously, fully, and voluntarily in the form that dwelt simultaneously within him and in the world. There is nothing merely abstract, although it is abstract, nothing to be brushed over. It's no merely intellectual matter. Soldiers who develop post-traumatic stress disorder frequently develop it not because of something they saw, but because of something they did. There are many demons, so to speak, on the battlefield. Involvement in warfare is something that can open a gateway to hell. Now and then something climbs through and possesses some naive farm boy from Iowa and he turns monstrous. He does something terrible. He rapes and kills the women and massacres the infants of Mylae. And he watches himself do it, and some dark part of him enjoys it, and that is the part that is most unforgettable. And later he will not know how to reconcile himself with the reality about himself and the world that was then revealed. And no wonder. In the great and fundamental myths of ancient Egypt, the god Horus, often regarded as a precursor to Christ, historically and conceptually speaking, experienced the same thing when he confronted his evil uncle Set, usurper of the throne of Osiris, Horus' father. Horus, the all-seeing Egyptian falcon god, the Egyptian eye of supreme eternal attention itself, has the courage to contend with Set's true nature, meeting him in direct combat. In the struggle with his dread uncle, however, his consciousness is damaged. He loses an eye. This is despite his godly stature and his unparalleled capacity for vision. What would a mere man lose who attempted the same thing? But perhaps he might gain an internal vision and understanding something proportional to what he loses in perception of the outside world. Note on the name Evil Uncle Set. In keeping with this observation is the fact that the word Set is an etymological precursor to the word Satan. See Murdoch, D.M., 2009. Christ in Egypt, the Horus Jesus Connection. Resuming. Satan embodies the refusal of sacrifice. He is arrogance incarnate, spite, deceit, and cruel conscious malevolence. He is pure hatred of man, God, and being. He will not humble himself, even when he knows full well that he should. Furthermore, he knows exactly what he is doing, obsessed with the desire for destruction, and does it deliberately, thoughtfully, and completely. It has to be him. Therefore, the very archetype of evil who confronts and tempts Christ, the archetype of good. It must be him who offers to the Savior of mankind under the most trying of conditions what all men most ardently desire. Satan first tempts the starving Christ to quell his hunger by transforming the desert rocks into bread. Then he suggests that he throw himself off a cliff calling on God and the angels to break his fall. Christ responds to the first temptation by saying, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What does this answer mean? It means that even under conditions of extreme privation, there are more important things than food. To put it another way, breath is of little use to the man who has betrayed his soul, even if he is currently starving. Note on starving. For anyone who thinks this is somehow unrealistic, given the concrete material reality and genuine suffering that is associated with privation, I would once again recommend Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which contains a series of exceptionally profound discussions about proper ethical behavior and its exaggerated, rather than diminished importance, 
in situations of extreme want and suffering. Resuming. Christ could clearly use his near-infinite power as Satan indicates to gain bread, and now to break his fast, even in the broader sense to gain wealth in the world which would theoretically solve the problem of bread more permanently. But at what cost, and to what gain? Gluttony in the midst of moral desolation? That's the poorest and most miserable of feasts. Christ aims, therefore, at something higher, at the description of a mode of being that would finally and forever solve the problem of hunger, if we all choose instead of expedience to dine on the word of God. That would require each and every person to live and produce and sacrifice and speak and share in a manner that would permanently render the privation of hunger a thing of the past. And that's how the problem of hunger in the privations of the desert is most truly and finally addressed. There are other indications of this in the Gospels, in dramatic enacted form. Christ is continually portrayed as the purveyor of endless sustenance. He miraculously multiplies bread and fish. He turns water into wine. What does this mean? It's a call to the pursuit of higher meaning as the mode of living that is simultaneously most practical and of highest quality. It's a call portrayed in dramatic literary form. Live as the archetypal Savior lives and you and those around you will hunger no more. The beneficence of the world manifests itself to those who live properly. That's better than bread. That's better than the money that will buy bread. Thus, Christ, the symbolically perfect individual, overcomes the first temptation. Two more follow. Throw yourself off that cliff, Satan says, offering the next temptation. If God exists, he will surely save you. If you are in fact his son, God will surely save you. Why would God not make himself manifest to rescue his only begotten child from hunger and isolation and the presence of great evil? But that establishes no pattern for life. It doesn't even work as literature. The deus ex machina, the emergence of a divine force that magically rescues the hero from his predicament, is the cheapest trick in the hack writer's playbook. It makes a mockery of independence and courage and destiny and free will and responsibility. Furthermore, God is in no wise a safety net for the blind. He's not someone to be commanded to perform magic tricks or forced into self-revelation, not even by his own son. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. This answer, though rather brief, dispenses with the second temptation. Christ does not casually order or even dare ask God to intervene on his behalf. He refuses to dispense with his responsibility for the events of his own life. He refuses to demand that God prove his presence. He refuses as well to solve the problems of mortal vulnerability in a merely personal manner by compelling God to save him because that would not solve the problem for everyone else and for all time. There is also the echo of the rejection of the comforts of insanity in this foregone temptation. Easy but psychotic self-identification as the merely magical Messiah might well have been a genuine temptation under the harsh conditions of Christ's sojourn in the desert. Instead, he rejects the idea that salvation, or even survival in the shorter term, depends on narcissistic displays of superiority and the commanding of God, even by his Son. Finally, comes the third temptation, the most compelling of all. Christ sees the kingdoms of the world laid before him for the taking. That's the siren call of earthly power, the opportunity to control and order everyone and everything. Christ is offered the pinnacle of the dominance hierarchy, the animalistic desire of every naked ape, the obedience of all, the most wondrous of estates, the power to build and to increase the possibility of unlimited sensual gratification. That's expedience writ large. But that's not all. Such expansion of status also provides unlimited opportunity for the inner darkness to reveal itself. The lust for blood, rape, and destruction is very much part of power's attraction. It is not only that men desire power so that they will no longer suffer. It is not only that they desire power so they can overcome subjugation to want, disease, and death. Power also means the capacity to take vengeance, ensure submission, and crush enemies. Grant Cain enough power and he will not only kill Abel, he will torture him first, imaginatively 
and endlessly. Then and only then will he kill him. Then he will come after everyone else. There is something above even the pinnacle of the highest dominance hierarchies, access to which should not be sacrificed for mere proximal success. It's a real place, too, although not to be conceptualized in the standard geographical sense of place we typically use to orient ourselves. I had a vision once of an immense landscape spread for miles out to the horizon before me. I was high in the air, granted a bird's eye view. Everywhere I could see great stratified multi-story pyramids of glass, some small, some large, some overlapping, some separate, all akin to modern skyscrapers all full of people striving to reach each pyramid's very pinnacle. But there was something above that pinnacle, a domain outside each pyramid, in which all were nested. That was the privileged position of the eye that could, or perhaps chose, to soar freely above the fray, that chose not to dominate any specific group or cause, but instead to somehow simultaneously transcend all. That was attention itself, pure and untrammeled, detached, alert, watchful intention, waiting to act when the time was right and the place had been established. As the Tao Te Ching has it, He who contrives defeats his purpose, and he who is grasping loses. The sage does not contrive to win, and therefore is not defeated. He is not grasping, so does not lose. There is a powerful call to proper being in the story of the third temptation. To obtain the greatest possible prize, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, the resurrection of paradise. The individual must conduct his or her life in a manner that requires the rejection of immediate gratification, of natural and perverse desires alike, no matter how powerfully and convincingly and realistically those are offered and dispense as well with the temptations of evil. Evil amplifies the catastrophes of life increasing dramatically the motivation for expediency already there because of the essential tragedy of being. Sacrifice of the more prosaic sort can keep that tragedy at bay more or less successfully, but it takes a special kind of sacrifice to defeat evil. It is the description of that special sacrifice that has preoccupied the Christian, and more than Christian, imagination for centuries. Why has it not had the desired effect? Why do we remain unconvinced that there is no better plan than lifting our eyes skyward, aiming at the good, and sacrificing everything to that ambition? Have we merely failed to understand, or have we fallen willfully, or otherwise, off the path? 